Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are Kirby Brown and Jennifer O'Neill. Kirby Brown is an associate professor of English and Native American studies at the University of Oregon. His research interests include Native American literary, intellectual, and cultural production from the late 18th century to the present and indigenous critical theory. His book, Stoking the Fire, Nationhood in Cherokee Writing, 1907 through 1970, was published in 2018 and was recently awarded the Thomas J. Lyons Award for Best Monograph in Western American Literary Studies. Brown is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Jennifer O'Neill is an assistant professor of indigenous race and ethnic studies at the University of Oregon. Her research interests include Native American and indigenous history, history of the American West, decolonizing methodologies, and cultural heritage archives. O'Neill is a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Brown and O'Neill, along with other stakeholders from the Native American Strategies Group, have collab collaborated with the Oregon Humanities Center to organize the 2019 Western Humanities Alliance Conference, Engaged Humanities, Partnerships Between Academia and Tribal Communities, on November 8th and 9th, 2019, at the University of Oregon. The Western Humanities Alliance is a consortium of regional universities, humanities centers, and institutes. It promotes innovative research in humanistic fields relating to current social, cultural, and scientific issues. A conference is held each year at a different institution. The Oregon Humanities Center decided to use the opportunity of hosting this year's conference to focus on issues relating to Native communities. Thank you both for coming on the show. So tell us first what the focus of the conference is. Um, so the focus of the conference is really kind of exploring the multiple ways that institutions like uh, universities or humanity centers, whether they're on university campuses or in, you know, in a municipal setting, um, can acknowledge the lands that they're held upon, the lands that they occupy as indigenous lands, um, and opportunities that exist for those institutions to form meaningful long-term relationships with tribal communities and to leverage their resources uh, to uh, towards tribal priorities and priorities that are important to Native communities. And so um, when the Oregon Humanities Center reached out to the Native community here on campus um, to partner uh, on this uh, symposium, you know, we thought it would be a great opportunity to highlight both the important work that's taking place here at the University of Oregon and some of the gains that this university has made in the ways that they've uh, been working to establish more meaningful relationships with uh, tribal nations uh, in Oregon and regionally. Uh, and then also to bring in scholars from outside the university, um, particularly our two keynote speakers and um, uh, uh, filmmakers and, and folks that are involved in, in recognition issues to, to come to campus to kind of situate what's happening locally in, in larger national and even in some cases international context. Will you say a little bit about what made uh, this topic per seem particularly timely now? Do you have a sense of that? Well, I think for us, uh, particularly throughout for Native faculty and the Native Strategies Group, it seemed like an ideal time to be able to highlight a lot of the amazing projects and successful partnerships that have been occurring here on campus for numerous years, but maybe people in the community or on campus are not aware of. So we felt it was a really great opportunity to highlight those projects, those really great successful partnerships that are also happening um, most likely out of a class or out of a curriculum. And so it was a great way to be able to highlight those um, at this particular time, as well as uh, seeing how our Native Studies minor is growing. And as we're working with other disciplines across campus, we've really seen this grow over the past five to six years. And we're just excited to be able to share a lot of that work that has been happening on campus and throughout the larger community. Well, we also seem to be in a moment, I think, locally and nationally where indigenous issues are um, kind of gaining more attention in a public consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Standing Rock is one yeah. example from a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, but I think indigenous communities, indigenous people, not just uh, on campuses, but you know, in their own tribal communities, in their own regions, are really leading um, a lot of these efforts, particularly in reference to resource management, land management, uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and so this just was another opportunity for us to kind of connect what we're doing here on campus to those larger movements. You know, uh, it seems to me this is a good opportunity. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's um, special about where we are in, the, in this place mm -hmm. and about the state of Oregon in relation to uh, the native communities that are on, in the state of Oregon, say so something about that. 
So we're in uh, a very special place in the fact that we are here on Kalapuya Ilihi, which is Kalapuya homeland. So the Kalapuya are the first indigenous peoples of the Willamette Valley. And we always highlight that in the work that we do in our classes and our events in reminding people that those are the people who were here first, but also in the context of the history of what happened to uh, those people who were forcibly removed from this homeland uh, in the treaties between 1851 and 1855 and then became members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. So we always use um, as many opportunities as possible to, to highlight that history, but also to talk about what has, of course, happened since then and how um, not only those tribes have uh, made successful partnerships or the work that they've been doing in the Willamette Valley, but also all of Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes. And that there is a um, nation to nation responsibility that both the tribes have, but also that the university has, meaning um, those, how are those relationships built and how are they sustained and how do we ensure that those are respected and that there's reconciliation and reciprocity in those relationships. So the university and the tribal communities have been, particularly the tribal communities, have been building amazing projects throughout numerous years since restoration of many of the tribes here in Oregon. And so it's an opportunity for finally the university to come on board and support a lot of those projects that many of us in Native Studies have been involved with, but it'd be great to get the larger community. So there's just some really unique projects that have been happening, which of course many of those we'll be talking about at the conference. So one of the things that I think, you, you, it's part of your area of expertise, but one of the things that will obviously come up in the conference is this idea of decolonizing methodologies. Mm -hmm. So why is that important? How do you understand that and why is that important? Decolonizing methodologies is really important and um, the, it's this concept that was originally developed by Linda Tohawi Smith, um, an amazing uh, uh, Mari um, academic who we all use in our work, but really the core of what she argues and calls for is a critical examination of Western ways of knowing that do not align with indigenous ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. And so her work really calls for decolonizing the way that historically academics, often non-native uh, academics, have worked with our communities over the years. So it's really a critical examination of that. And rather than more extractive work that has often been done in our communities, it's more of a way of saying academics we that may want to work in our communities flipping how that work is done rather than academics coming in and saying, um, we have this idea and I wanna do this work with you. Rather, the, those scripts need to be flipped and it needs to be said, hey, I'm here as an advocate. What is this tribal community working on? And how can I be of service to help you to work on those projects or goals? And it's also about giving back and sharing back. And so whatever uh, an academic or a group may want to do and work on with a community, if they are producing something out of that work, they have a responsibility to give back and share back that work with the community, that it should be a shared ownership mm -hmm. and often ownership just by the tribal community um, so that we make reciprocity for a lot of the um, horrible things and atrocities that have happened in tribal communities and so that the tribal community is always leading the way and always being the one who's setting the way for projects rather than the other way around. Why do you think it's a particular responsibility for universities to participate in this uh, re uh, reciprocity? I think, I mean, especially in a public land grant institution um, like the University of Oregon, uh, I was having this conversation with my students yesterday on the first day of Intro to Native Lit, and I, and, you know, I, I start that course by uh, by asking just a few questions about, you know, indigenous history in the state of Oregon, and just a show of hands of, of students who are aware of, you know, the peoples whose land we're on now, or the nine federally recognized tribes, or their locations in the state of Oregon, um, things like indigenous language, and, you know, I'm surprised every year 
at the, well, no longer as surprised as I used to be, but um, surprised at how few students, even students that are from the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. they come here, um, the, the knowledge that they don't possess about mm -hmm. indigenous history. Mm -hmm. um, and so as land grant institutions like the University of Oregon, whose existence is predicated precisely mm -hmm. on the forced removals and dispossession of the first peoples of these lands, um, and who as, as uh, kind of outward facing institutional representatives of the state government in many ways, mm -hmm. uh, that they also, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, have a particular responsibility and a nation to nation responsibility and a trust responsibility to engage with tribal communities, um, to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of native students and native histories and cultures and ongoing presences here on campuses. Mm -hmm. um, I think as land grant institutions, they have a particular responsibility uh, to, f to fulfill and strengthen those relationships. And one of the keynote speakers, uh, Mishwana Goman, for, who's a, a Tonawanda uh, Seneca scholar at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, is gonna be specific, uh, speaking specifically about that. Uh, moving past a territorial recognition, mm -hmm. a lot of universities are adopting mm -hmm. this, which, which is an important move to acknowledge the indigenous homelands on which mm -hmm. these institutions set. But sometimes those acknowledgements can, can become performative. Mm -hmm. um, and then we move on and we don't talk about it again, mm -hmm. uh, or we don't think more critically about what kind of relationships we're actually looking to form between institutions and tribal communities. Uh, and so, you know, her keynote is gonna address that specifically, but I think, you know, the University of Oregon as a land grant institution, um, has a particular responsibility to fulfill those relationships. So you mentioned uh, one of the keynoters. Would you want to say something about the other people that will be the keynote speakers? Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, so the other keynote address is going to, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the most recent um, address in a long series uh, that has been uh, sponsored here at the University of Oregon. Um, by Kathy Lynn and Mark Carey, uh, professors of environmental science. Um, and it's an indigenous peoples and climate change lecture that they host every year. And so this year we have Fawn Sharp, uh, who is the president of the Quinault Indian Nation, uh, and Clarita Left Hand Begay, who's from the Diné Nation and is a professor at the University of Washington. And so they'll be talking, I think, about um, uh, Fawn will be talking, I, I would imagine, about tribally specific and, and uh, impacts of climate change in her community and what, how her community is responding and kind of, kind of the policy initiatives uh, that they are uh, putting in place to, to address and be proactively respond to the climate impacts in their communities. Mm -hmm. And um, Clarita's work, I think, in the institution is going to be making that at, at, the, at the University of Washington will make that connection, right? So we have, you know, a, a, a Washington uh, tribal uh, president uh, who's uh, work is with a specific community, and then we're going to have you know a representative from an institution like the University of Washington speaking back and forth to one another, which I think is one of the kinds of connections that this symposium or the conference as a whole is seeking to to uh, to foster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like uh, all academic conferences is that it's not just going to be a bunch of panels mm -hmm. with people talking. So. There'll be a, a number of other activities that'll happen. Among them is a concert reading of uh, the play by uh, UO professor, uh, co a, a collaboration uh, by the, the UO professor, Teresa May of Theater Arts. The play is called Salmon is Everything. I know, I know Kirby has participated in concert, conference reading, concert readings of this play before. Have you, Jennifer, as well? I haven't, but I teach it in my class. Okay, so you're both mm -hmm. well <laughs> versed in this play. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about this play and why it's important. So the play focuses on uh, the examination of uh, the salmon kill that happened on the Klamath River Basin um, and the relationships between the um, tribes of that area as well as the non-native people um, that include the farmers, um, the town, and how when you have an issue around natural resources and tribal rights and sovereignty, what are the different issues that that arises? How does it affect the various different people that are involved? And most importantly, how does it affect the tribal community when um, those outsiders who are trying to control natural resources in a particular way, how does it affect the tribal community and their way of life and for a resource that they've been connected to for since time immemorial? And so it really highlights a lot of those major issues that arise as well as gives some great talking points and issues for people to think of that they may not even be aware of. And most often we find that when this play is 
performed or there's a concert reading afterwards, many people are shocked to know they didn't know about this history mm -hmm. or they didn't know about the fish kill that happened. So it's not only to bring awareness of the actual event, mm -hmm. but it's also to provide a different perspective, particularly t tied um, with the keynote speakers about climate change, natural resources, why that's so important. And so why we're doing that is to be holistic in the type of presentations that we're giving, just in echoing back to what we talked about, decolonizing research. It's also uh, presenting different ways of learning and knowing our own history. Mm -hmm. And that's often in an oral tradition or a performance. Mm -hmm. And so Native theater is very important to tribal communities. And who are the performers? So most of the performers are part of the Native Theater Group, which is just volunteers and students and community partners who uh, have been doing this before, who have performed before with the concert reading or with the play when it was performed here at the University of Oregon. And so they gather people from campus, from the community who are just have uh, a strong interest in doing this and who are very passionate about doing this work. Mm. So we have faculty, graduate students, community members, uh, some partners at LCC in their longhouse, so it's an opportunity for us to kind of cultivate that relationship too between mm -hmm. our two longhouses and yeah. our two campuses. Very cool. Um, also there's going to be a, a, f a screening of a documentary film, The Promised Land. Tell us about that film and the filmmakers. Yeah, so The Promised Land is a, is a film that's uh, really centered on recognition issues and recognition struggles, federal recognition struggles of uh, two tribal nations here in the region, the Chinook Indian Nation and uh, the Duwamish Nation uh, in Washington. Um, and it, it it's about, in, 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 in one sense it's about recognition and it's about these two communities specific struggles to have treaties that were signed but never ratified mm -hmm. um, in the past that resulted in their forcible removal um, honored uh, and and it's it it brings to light I think uh, a, a great many issues that uh, the general public is probably not well well aware of so mm -hmm. the the incredibly bureaucratic and uh, difficult process of attaining federal recognition uh, by tribal communities, the, the need to, 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 to secure that recognition as a way to develop tribal priorities and, and uh, tribal resources and, and, and take care of communities. Um, in a larger sense, it's about tribal sovereignty, mm -hmm. though, I think, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the history mm -hmm. of tribal nations and their relationships to the United States government and that fraught history and that ongoing history. Um, and so we are really privileged to have uh, Tony Johnson, who's the tribal chairman of the Chinook Indian Nation, uh, is going to be here, uh, as well as uh, Sarah Salcedo, who's one of the filmmakers. And so they'll be able to, uh, audience will be able to have a Q&A with them afterwards. So we'll screen the um, we'll screen the film and then we'll open it up for uh, question and answers after Tony and, and Sarah have an opportunity to speak a bit about the film. So you, you mentioned the two of them. Tell us some of the other uh, people from the Native communities that will be participating in the conference. So we've tried to reach out to uh, and include as many of the tribal community partners that we've worked with on different projects on campus, and those include a lot of tribal elders. So we've invited Esther Stutzman, who is a Kalapuya tribal elder, because she's worked uh, really directly with both campus and the city of Eugene to highlight Kalapuya history mm -hmm. through projects like the Kalapuya Talking Stones, the Willamette River Festival, uh, really great, amazing projects. So we wanted to make sure to have her here. We also have Myra Johnson Orange coming from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. She'll be talking about the Northern Paiute History Project mm -hmm. that uh, I've been part of through the Honors College. And um, we also have others um, like the tribal elder in residence, Marta Clifford, who is working with the Native Theater Program. So we wanted to be as inclusive as possible, as possible to be able to have as many people from the community uh, to be able to speak to these projects. So it's not just us mm -hmm. as the Native faculty or staff or academics, but really speaking back to what our whole comprehensive goal is, is to include those perspectives that they are our um, professors, they are our knowledge keepers, and as such we need to have them here for those types of events as well as part of these projects. Because that's a larger project that we're trying to institute across campus for mm -hmm. these types of initiatives, that um, they are part of the curriculum and that they are our experts that we go to. 
So you mentioned in um, your collaboration on the Northern Paiute History Project. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that project. Sure, so that's a project that we started about five years ago that is a collaboration between the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and the Burns Paiute Tribe. And it's really speaking back to and implementing the whole decolonizing research methodology. So going to those tribes and saying, we are teaching this class about indigenous research methods. And uh, through the Honors College, the students are engaging in and conducting a research class and um, producing a paper. But we want them to be doing something that they can share back and give back and that is engaged in doing historical research that can be given back to the community. So we mm -hmm. met with tribal elders, experts from the community and say, we're doing this class. What are some questions that we should have our students investigate? And how should they be approaching this work? And so in working with the community, we came up with those research questions and they would continue to change every year. And then the core part of that um, project as well is actually taking them into the community. Mm -hmm. So the core of it is really, again, speaking to that entering tribal relations, respecting and going to the tribal land. And so we take them on a field research trip where they spend two days with tribal elders, speaking with them, listening to their oral traditions, going to the museum at Worm Springs, going to sacred sites that are important to them. So that they're not just learning in the classroom, but they're getting outside of the classroom because of course, that tribal community is not here. We need to go to them and show, it really shows that commitment. And at the end of the class, then when they produce their research paper, we then share that and give that back to the community. We share that here, of course, on campus, but the biggest part for us is sharing back and giving back to the mm -hmm. community those research. So we actually print it out in a monograph and mm -hmm. um, we give that back to the community. And I think it really kind of emphasizes the theme, one of the central themes of decolonizing research is the concept of stewardship. So what does it mean to steward information um, in partnership with or collaboration with tribal mm -hmm. communities rather than to possess and, and uh, protect information. And, and so it's, it's more about outreach and collaboration than it is about gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. So Jennifer, um, you, you are now an assistant professor, mm -hmm. uh, but you have been at the University of Oregon yeah. for quite some time working mm -hmm. as an archivist and a historian of cultural heritage. Tell mm -hmm. us about how, that, how you do that work. A little bit about that. Sure. So yeah, I've been prior to becoming assistant professor. I served for seven years as the university historian and archivist. And so within that, um, not only was I serving as a curator for university archives and all of those collections, I had a real concerted effort as well to highlight a lot of marginalized histories on campus. So worked on highlighting a lot of the hidden history of campus. And then part of my own research and focus is also highlighting and focusing on the importance of bringing in uh, stewardship and um, the particular needs of tribal collections. So how should tribal collections that are often found in non-tribal repositories mm -hmm. like universities mm -hmm. or historical societies, that have been taken far from their homeland? How should universities be caring for those collections? What are protocols? What are best practices? So I've been part of those initiatives since very early in my career, since like 2006, when we drafted the protocols for Native American archival materials. So we continue to bring awareness to those issues and continually stress how to do that work, but more importantly, produce projects that are specific to how we can center cultural heritage, how we can have platforms and software that help communities to do that. So not only is it important that we work here on the university to do that, but how can we also work with tribal communities that are also trying to do that? So it's also figuring out what is our role at a university if we have that material mm -hmm. and how do we engage with the tribal community to get their expertise and have them steward the collection. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Can you tell us about the Southwest uh, Oregon Research Project? Yeah, sure. So the Southwest Oregon Research Project was actually started uh, in about 1995 by a group of uh, Native faculty, staff, and students that knew a lot of the materials that related to uh, tribes specifically in Western Oregon were actually not here, that many of them resided in Washington, D.C., the National Archives, the mm -hmm. National Anthropological Archives, Library of Congress, mm -hmm. and so they had a concerted effort and got funding to go to D.C. to 
copy as many materials as possible. And then, of course, it was actually photocopying materials. Nothing was digitized. So it was a digital return project. Um, which would eventually become digital um, as we were able to scan a lot of the material. But it was really at the forefront of doing these types of projects that are now very prevalent in mm -hmm. many communities. Mm -hmm. But it was the idea of bringing back that material so that it could be used for restoration efforts, for learning our history, for um, connecting back with that history that had been lost, mm -hmm. uh, because it includes not only information about from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but it also in includes language material and our stories and legends, things that uh, were collected by anthropologists, and, but then were taken far away. Um, so it's reconnecting with those collections. And th so there's a continual effort to build that collection out still and continue to add to it. And there have been uh, people, particularly um, folks like David Lewis, who is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, who led that effort, as well as Jason Yonker. So they were both really instrumental um, in trying to get that work done. Are any of the uh, the uh, original materials being repatriated, or are they? No. So those materials remain at those federal repositories. And because of the complexities of, the, of trying to do a actual repatriation repatriation or return because of federal laws and regulations, um, mainly repatriation covers objects and sacred objects. It mm. doesn't necessarily often uh, pertain to physical mm. uh, materials like uh, letters or records or photographs. So that is the whole reason why we drafted and implemented the protocols for Native American archival materials because there are no laws protecting Native American archives. Hmm, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. So we have like two minutes left. Um, what do you hope non-Native participants will take away from the conference in two minutes? Uh, <laughs> just two minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, I hope that I hope that they'll they'll come away from the conference knowing that we're on Kalapui Ilhi. I hope they'll come away from the conference seeing uh, Indigenous presence. Um, and uh, an indigenous agency, you know, the, 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 the fact that native peoples and native communities are on the forefront of a lot of n the most critical issues that are facing not just tribal communities or the state of Oregon or the United States, but the globe right now. Um, and so I hope they come away uh, uh, maybe having some, uh, any kind of uh, assumptions, uh, popularly held assumptions that they might come into the symposium with uh, unsettled a bit in, in a good way. Uh -huh. Jennifer, you want to add anything? Yeah, I hope they come out with a knowledge and understanding of how important building uh, respectful relationships are, because the key to all these projects are building those relationships, and not just relationships where you go into a community for a short time, but these are sustained relationships that are really important to ensure the success of a lot of these projects, and also that people come out of it seeing how to slow down their research maybe a bit mm -hmm. and um, center those relationships rather than just having that goal of doing research. But it's actually about building the relationships and seeing how far ahead um, actually these tribal communities have known much of this knowledge and had this, but it, and it's honoring and respecting that and placing them at the center. So really centering tribal knowledge and uh, all the amazing projects that are coming out of these communities. Okay, well, thank you both for a fascinating interview. Mm -hmm. It just said it's gonna be a great conference. Yeah. We're very excited. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I've been speaking with Kirby Brown, Associate Professor of English and Native American Studies at the University of Oregon, and Jennifer O'Neill, Assistant Professor of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies at the University of Oregon. They've collaborated with the Oregon Humanities Center to organize the conference Engaged Humanities, Partnerships Between Academia and Tribal Communities, on November 8th and 9th, 2019 at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.